What's up, cool people? My name's Matt. Welcome back to our Bible study. Okay, so now we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 16. Um, just more commands from before being repeated. <laughs> I don't know if there's really too much else to say for context. People are about to go into the promised land. They kind of need to know how God wants them to live. Which, now that I think about it, the previous time when a lot of these commands were given was at Mount Sinai before they were about to venture on their journey through the wilderness. So it's interesting how both instances of this were kind of like, okay, in preparation for going into this new chapter of, you know, the broader journey of your people, here's some stuff that you should know and keep in mind. But anyway, okay, so here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 16. In honor of the Lord your God, celebrate the Passover each year in the early spring, in the month of Abib. For that was the month in which the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Your Passover sacrifice may be from either the flock or the herd, and it must be sacrificed to the Lord your God at the designated place of worship, the place he chooses for his name to be honored. Eat it with bread made without yeast. For seven days the bread you must you eat must be made without yeast, as when you escape from Egypt in such a hurry. Eat this bread, the bread of suffering, so that as long as you live you will remember the day that you departed from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in any house throughout your land for those seven days. And when you sacrifice the Passover lamb on the evening of the first day, do not let any of the meat remain until the next morning. Pausing there. So, Passover feast. It's been covered before, but basically it's to remember them being delivered from Egypt. Um, they're supposed to eat unleavened bread because, like, that's how they had to eat it as they were leaving Egypt. Because they wouldn't have had time to make it with yeast for it to actually, like, you know, rise and whatnot. Like you would normally have it do when made with yeast. Um, and the Passover lamb is supposed to be reminiscent of the lamb that they, you know, would have slaughtered to, you know paint the blood on the door frames and whatnot. And at least that one for the first day, they weren't supposed to leave any of it remaining until the next morning. Probably because, you know, again, similar to when they were leaving Egypt, they, they, like, they didn't really have time then to keep it till the next day. They had to leave during the night. Um... So, yeah, it's not necessarily an exact replica of that experience, but still, you know, bringing in some of those ideas as a reminder. So then, moving on to verse 5. You may not sacrifice the Passover in just any of the towns that the Lord your God is giving you. You must offer it only at the designated place of worship the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Sacrifice it there in the evening as the sun goes down on the anniversary of your exodus from Egypt. Roast the lamb and eat it in the place the Lord your God chooses. Then you may go back to your tents the next morning. For the next six days, you may not eat any bread made with yeast. On the seventh day, proclaim another holy day in honor of the Lord your God, and no work may be done on that day. So, when this was previously stated at Mount Sinai, there wasn't the whole part about going back to their tents <laughs> the next morning. Um, probably because it's like, well, they would have been traveling throughout the wilderness. So, it's not like they would have really had as far to go from the the tabernacle where they would have 
you know, sacrificed the Passover offerings anyway in that context. Um, I don't know. Otherwise, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, the day of rest at the end of all that. Because it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's like a holy remembrance. So, whether or not this fell on the normal Sabbath day, they were supposed to basically have another additional Sabbath-esque day because of this special event. Speaking of special events, it seems like that's going to be what we're talking about for the next couple of sections here. So, moving right along to verse 9. Count off seven weeks from when you first begin to cut the grain at the time of harvest. Then celebrate the festival of harvest to honor the Lord your God. Bring him a voluntary offering in proportion to the blessings you have received from him. This is a time to celebrate before the Lord your God at the designated place of worship he will choose for his name to be honored. Celebrate with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites from your towns, and the foreigners, orphans, and widows who live among you. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, so be careful to obey all these decrees. So basically this is, you know, kind of recognition of the fact that what they have comes from God in a similar notion to offering up the firstborn of their flocks and whatnot. They were supposed to, I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily they were supposed to give the first of their crops for this like the regular tithe would have been but in any case possibly in order to like seek God's blessing on the harvest for that year they were supposed to you know give this offering to God as um I'm trying to think. There were certain categories of offerings that were mentioned back a couple of books ago in the Bible, but in any case, yeah, this was like a, hey, thanks for what you've given us so far. Please continue giving us, you know, good things and, you know, more crops and whatnot. Uh, it's footnote there. Hebrew says Festival of Weeks. Uh, this was later called the Festival of Pentecost, and that's that's been addressed a couple of times. Uh, also celebrated today as Shavat. Um, I'm wondering if I missed a footnote up here. Oh yeah, the first one I missed was related to uh, the month of Abib. Hebrew says, "Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord your God." that really only changes the wording in that it's like, hey, Abib is the month of the Passover. Remember that. Okay. Moving on to the next uh, festival celebration thing. Verse 13. You must observe the festival of shelters for seven days at the end of the harvest season, after the grain has been threshed and the grapes have been pressed. This festival will be a happy time of celebrating with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows from your towns. For seven days you must celebrate this festival to honor the Lord your God at the place he chooses. For it is he who blesses you with bountiful harvests and gives you success in all your work. This festival will be a time of great joy for all. Okay. Um, footnote there. It's also called the Festival of Booths or, or of Tabernacles. Earlier called the Festival of the Final Harvest or of Ingathering. So, yeah, the, the previous Festival of Harvest was kind of earlier on. Um, kind of 
wishing that the rest of the harvest goes well. This one is after the harvest season is done and is sort of like a thanks for what they got out of the harvest. And similarly, though, like they were supposed to celebrate it with, you know, all the people around them. Like anybody that they would have really had close contact with and even some that wouldn't necessarily have had the closest contact, but that were still kind of nearby. Um, but of course, like the Levites, foreigners, orphans, widows, and whatnot, they would have been the people kind of in need who, I mean, maybe not so much the Levites, but people who generally relied on the gifts of others to, you know, just kind of stay alive and get by. So, like, I find it interesting how some of these, it, like, specifically says, hey, like, celebrate these festivals with, you know, people around you who are less fortunate. And, like, kind of like what was talked about in the last chapter, it's like, don't withhold your wealth to yourself. Like, use these as times to, like, help other people around you and help provide for them. Anyway. Uh, moving on to verse 16. Still talking about the same festival. Each year, every man in Israel must celebrate these three festivals. The festival of unleavened bread, festival of harvest, and the festival of shelters. On each of these occasions, all men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he chooses, but they must not appear before the Lord without a gift for him. All must give as they are able, according to the blessings given to them by the Lord your God. Okay, real quick little tangent thing. I find it interesting how even when the he or him in this context is talking about God, it doesn't capitalize it like a lot of Christians tend to do today. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, sometimes, though, we'll capitalize the H in him when... It's like some of those times when we do that, it's not necessarily obvious by context that we're talking about God without the capital H. But anyway, uh, yeah, so three festivals for them to celebrate each year. And they're supposed to bring an offering to God at the approved place once that's established. Okay, then to verse 18, and we'll wrap up the chapter. Appoint judges and officials for yourselves from each of your tribes in all the towns the Lord your God is giving you. They must judge the people fairly. You must never twist justice or show partiality. Never accept a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the decisions of the godly. Let true justice prevail so you may live and occupy the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must never set up a wooden Asherah pole beside the altar you build for the Lord your God, and never set up sacred pillars for worship, for the Lord your God hates them. Kind of random related to all the other stuff we've been talking about here, but uh, for that first section there, Again, this was mentioned previously, but, you know, having the judges appointed to, and really ultimately, I think they were supposed to try and make sure that these judges would judge fairly, you know, before even really appointing them as much as they could. Um, I feel like that's just sort of an implication of this here in the way that it's worded. Um, but in any case, like, 
not even just the judges, but people in general, not only then but now, who follow God, are called not to twist justice or show partiality. That was hit on in a fair bit of detail before. I want to say that was in Leviticus, but not sure of the exact location within the Bible where it stated that previously. But anyway, yeah, like, if you're, you know, judging over God's people, you should try and reflect how God would judge a certain situation, which would be fairly and rightly, and not, like, changing, you know, your judgment just because of money or even lack thereof or because of some connection that you had or whatever god wouldn't judge that way so we shouldn't either and also a bunch of these commands as we're just reading through them are talking about things like, you know, so you may live and occupy the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's like consistent reminders all throughout this that like, hey, if you do these things, you'll be okay in the promised land. But if you don't, like, things might not go so well because you'll be turning away from God and therefore you won't really so much have his blessing because you've turned away. Um, uh, as far as the last verse or two there, it's just like God had his established places and ways to worship. So why would they be setting up anything else unless they've already, you know, gone off to basically follow slash believe in other gods, um, like, Asherah poles were specifically for a different belief system that some of the peoples around them followed. So, we don't need these other things from false gods showing the corruption right there next to what's supposed to be a sign of worshipping you know, the one true God, the Lord, Yahweh. Um, so basically, don't set up other stuff that shows that you're worshiping other gods. Because, unsurprisingly, the Lord don't like that. Anywho, okay. So I guess that will do it for Deuteronomy 16. Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 16 had a little bit of an em emphasis on the festivals and just reiterating those for the new generation of Israelites who wouldn't have heard, you know, about those before. They probably observed them, but maybe didn't really hear the original commands or the purpose behind them. Although they should have from their families in theory. But anyway, I digress. So, that's all I have to say on that. As always, like and share if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you're on YouTube to get updates when I post new videos. Feel free to follow me on Rumble or any of the social media pages down in the description. Um, and below there, leave comments with any thoughts you have. Whether it's Bible related or otherwise. So, that's going to do it for now. Hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I'll see you for the next video. But until then, stay cool, people.